Welcome to the Nicholas 11X12 technology. Today we're looking at the brand new Intel Core i5 3550 22nm Ivy Bridge processor. I'd like to thank Forticus for providing me this product and it really recommend the computer store and online shop. But now let's move on to the box. Once again it's an Intel Core i5 processor and it's the i5-3550 which uses the LGA-1155 socket just like all the other Ivy Bridge CPUs do. Here on the side it will basically tell you the features the CPU offers. On the back of the box there's a description in different languages. On the other side some specs are listed there. On the top is the CPU which you can see it through the plastic case. Now let's see what's inside the box. Here are the installation instructions and on the back is your Core i5 sticker. Of course the CPU also comes with a heatsink. It's fairly small as you can see and thermal paste comes reapplied. The fan uses a 4 pin header. And here's the processor itself in a plastic case. I'll go ahead and open this up so you can see it better. There you go, it looks like a standard Intel processor of course but it looks very nice. And here on the back are the contacts, don't touch these. For this review I'll be installing this processor in the MSI C77A-GD65 motherboard which I reviewed earlier before. And just so you know I installed the Cooler Master V6GT CPU cooler instead of the Intel stock heatsink. Now to the specifications. The Intel Core i5-3550 is a quad-core Ivy Bridge CPU that has a base clock of 3.3 GHz and a turbo clock of 3.7 GHz. It features the Intel HD 2500 graphics and has a TDP of 77 watts. It's using the brand new 22 nanometer architecture and offers 1 MB of level 2 cache and 6 MB of level 3 cache. It also supports dual channel DDR3 1600 memory natively. Here in CPU-C this processor gets detected and once again we're looking at an Ivy Bridge CPU that runs in a LGA-1155 socket. The TDP got lower compared to 95 watts on previous generation Sandy Bridge CPUs. It's a new 22 nanometer process but the voltage increased a little compared to Sandy Bridge. That's because of Intel's new Trigate technology. This means the temperatures should also get a little higher. The latest instructions are used here and the core clock is at 1.6 GHz right now on idle. It'll go all the way up to 3.7 GHz when turbo kicks in. You could also overclock this processor, but there's a strict limit since it's not the K processor. Here's the cache and we're looking at the quad core CPU with 4 threads and there's no hyper threading like on core i7 processors. This also is the main difference. Once again this is running on an MSI Z77A-GD65 motherboard with the latest BIOS version at the time of this video. For the memory I got 8GB of DDR3 2000MHz RAM installed. This is a great benefit of Ivy Bridge, it supports a lot more frequencies than Sandy Bridge did. For instance I couldn't achieve 2000MHz on the memory without overclocking the platform. In this case with the new 22 nanometer CPUs that's not a problem anymore. But now let's move on to the benchmarks. This is the test system I'm going to use. First is 3D Mark Vantage at the performance preset of course. The CPU score is 20,312 so really for the price this is an amazing score. I personally didn't think it would get that high since it's getting close to a core i7 CPU already. There definitely is an improvement over the last generation. I seriously didn't expect that, but let's see what I get in the 3D Mark 11. Of course I'm also running this at the performance preset. I scored P4182, which is quite a nice system score already. There's nothing to complain, gaming should definitely be no problem at all. And I ran this with a GTX 560 non-TI version. Next is Cinebench release 11.5. I got 6.21 points for the CPU, which is better than the previous generation Core i5-2500K. You will definitely notice that extra speed improvement when it comes to rendering. Here in ADA64 cache and memory benchmark I got great results on the memory and very impressive results on a cache as well. It doesn't matter level 1, level 2 or level 3 cache, they all have great transfer rates. The level 3 cache latency is 4.0 nanoseconds which is a lot faster than the previous generation chips. And right here you will see turbo boost kicked in with 3.7 GHz. Now it's time to calculate with Super Pi. The CPU will now calculate 1 million digits of Pi. It didn't take long at all, just 10.016 seconds. Of course this isn't the world's best score, but for the price it's very very good. Now to the last synthetic test W'. 
I'll let the CPU calculate 32 million integers across all available cores. It's done in just 10.045 seconds, which is very similar to the previous test. Once again, great timing for the price. In Dirt 3 at 680 by 1050 on max out ultra high settings I get a minimum frame rate of 49 FPS and 58 FPS on average, which is very very nice. It's very smooth and there's no lag at all. Of course Dirt 3 isn't the most demanding game, but for that we should then look at Battlefield 3. I ran it at 680 by 1050 on ultra settings, but disabled the MSAA and lowered the AF to 1x. The frame rates look perfectly with 46 FPS on minimum, 61 FPS at average, and 79 FPS at max. So there's no lag in sight. The gameplay should be completely lag free. Keep in mind that I'm running this CPU with a GTX 560 non-TI graphics card. Also before I forget the CPU has integrated graphics like mentioned already in the beginning. Of course it will not be able to handle games like a GTX 560 or so, but for basic usage it's good enough. For example I run 3D Mark Vantage here, just to give you a basic idea on how the score may look like. I ran it at the performance preset and scored 1603, which is quite low. You'll not be able to play games on medium settings or higher, but still it's good to know there's an iGPU inside, just in case you don't have a graphics card yet or have problems with it. I rendered 3 at 1280 by 800 at ultra low settings and got 29 FPS on minimum and 39 FPS on average, which is not too bad for an integrated GPU. In Battlefield 3 the results look a little worse, especially Especially when the resolution has to be lowered even more to get acceptable results. I turned everything off and settings are on low. The minimum frame rate is 17, on average I got 24 FPS and at max 36 FPS. So I'd actually called it unplayable, but the iGPU wasn't meant for gaming anyways. And now to the temperatures. On idle I get 26 degrees celsius which are 79 degrees fahrenheit. On load it goes all the way up to 62 degrees celsius which are 144 degrees fahrenheit. My ambient room temperature was at 22 degrees celsius which are 72 degrees fahrenheit when I ran the tests. On idle I get very nice results, it's very cool, but on load it gets a little hot. But Intel confirmed that's totally normal, the temperature should just not exceed 100 degrees celsius which are 212 degrees fahrenheit. Anything under 100 is safe according to Intel. Now to the last test, the power consumption. On idle the CPU with the GTX 560 draw around 58 watts. On load the CPU with the GTX 560 on idle draw around 117 watts. When I take out the GTX 560 and let the CPU run on idle with the iGPU it only draws 45 watts. On load with the CPU and iGPU alone it draws around 104 watts. So the power consumption decreased dramatically compared to the previous generation Sandy Bridge CPUs. Intel did a great job on that. The Intel Core i5-3550 is a great CPU for the price, offers great performance and has a very low power consumption. Intel of course once again did a great job. Pros are amazing price performance ratio, very low power consumption and it also supports high frequency memory and allows more variants of frequencies. For the cons I have nothing to say at all. I give this processor a 10 out of 10 and definitely recommend it. Once again I'd like to thank Forticus for providing me this product. The review of the Intel Core i7-3770K is coming very soon. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe.